Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise for the playing of our national anthem and remain standing for the invocation by Chaplain Floyd Smith of the 8th Air Force. of Converse Fort Worth plant, I welcome all of you today. We're very glad that you braved the hot sun to come out and watch us deliver the last B-36 bomber to the United States Air Force. Because of this sun and the heat, we're keeping the program short, and we're operating to a rather fast timetable, as you can tell by looking at your printed programs. We're very sorry that we don't have seats for all of you. And we could have provided seats for a few hundred, but rather than do this uh, and favor a few and not all, we let it go as it is. Now today we are witnessing the end of an era for Convair, for Fort Worth, for the Air Force, and for aviation in general. The experimental XB-36 bomber flew here in Fort Worth eight years ago, and various models of the B-36 have been in production here ever since. Today, we are delivering the last of the B-36s to the Air Force in this special ceremony. Everyone on the speaker's platform today is worthy of an introduction, but the time schedule prevents my recognizing all of them. We do have several special guests, however, whom I would like to introduce to you at this time. Again, in the interest of time, please do not applaud until all of these special guests have been introduced. The simplest procedure, I guess, would be to start on my left and to go down the row asking each guest to stand for a moment as his name is called. I'm going to skip the three persons who are scheduled to speak. First on my left, Chaplain Floyd S. Smith, Air Force, 8th Air Force Chaplain. Uh, next on my left, Mr. Charles E. Nash, President of the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. Next on my left, Mr. R.C. Siebold, Vice President of Engineering for Converse General Offices in San Diego. Sparky was formerly Chief Engineer at the Fort Worth Division. Next, on my left, Colonel Columbus, better known as Doc Savage, Air Force Plant Representative at Convair Fort Worth for the past three years. Next to Colonel Savage is Colonel Stephen P. Dillon, formerly Assistant Air Force Plant Rep at Convair Fort Worth, formerly Plant Rep at Convair San Diego, and the first Air Force pilot to fly the B-36. He's now Director of Materiel for the 99th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, which flies our B-36s at Fairchild Air Force Base, Spokane, Washington. And Colonel Dillon will fly back to Spokane this, Spokane this afternoon aboard this last B-36. Next to Colonel Dillon is Colonel Beverly H. Warren formerly Air Force plant representative at Convair Fort Worth during the time that the B-36s were being built and flight tested.
Next to Colonel Warren, Brigadier General, General Louis L. Mundell, Deputy Commander, San Antonio Air Material Area, General Mundell. And last on my right is Congressman-elect James C. Wright from the 12th Congressional District. And finally, I would like to introduce the crew from the 92nd Bomb Wing, Fairchild Air Force Base, who will fly away this final B-36 in a very few minutes. They are Major Lawrence M. Nickerson, Captain Thomas J. Camel, Major Donald D. Trimmel, Major Paul E. Gord, Lieutenant Mason L. Rip, Captain Ralph M. Halsey, Master Sergeant Henry J. Hansen, Technical Sergeant Donald E. Johnson, Aircraftsman Second Class Frederick E. Smith, Jr., Staff Sergeant Burton F. Blakey, Blakely, Staff Sergeant Gene I. Gray, Aircraftsman Second Class L. E. Schmidlin, and Tech Sergeant John Souls. Now, how about a nice round of applause? Included in our guests here on the speaker's platform are members of the city council, county commissioners, directors of the chamber of commerce, mayors of the surrounding cities and towns, presidents of the unions here at Convair Fort Worth, presidents of other aircraft companies in the Fort Worth, Dallas area, Fort Worth, Dallas area, that's correct, and Air Force officers from various commands. I'm sorry we do not have time to introduce each of them. We certainly appreciate their coming here for the ceremony. Here to represent the city of Fort Worth today is Mayor Pro Tem, Knight. He's practically a native of Fort Worth. At least he spent some 45 years here. He's now serving his third two-year term on the city council, having set new records for votes received each time that he has run for office. He's active in civic and community affairs, being, among other things, a vice president of the United Fund. Mayor Pro Tem M.M. M. McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Essenwine. General McNarney, General Griswold, General Montgomery, General Odom, General Baker, other generals and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Mayor Dean asked me to tell you that he cannot recall any invitation he's ever received that he appreciated more than wanting to say a few words at this special delivery ceremony of the B-36. But he received a telegram yesterday that made his personal appearance impossible. He hasn't the slightest suspicion that I sent the telegram. I, too, coveted the privilege of representing Fort Worth on this occasion because the B-36 and Convair are so vital part of our city and state. This is an aviation... This is an aviation city, an aviation state, and this is an aviation milestone in an aviation age, which is very apparent. We were justly proud when Consolidated Vultee accepted our invitation to come into our town. And we were elated when the first B-24 came off your assembly line. But some of us grew a little doubtful, though hopeful, when you ventured into building the then gigantic B-32 for the Air Force in World War II. Later, eight years ago last Sunday, the experimental model of the B-36 took off from this same runway. Today, the last production model will take off. This represents the end of an era for the Air Force, for Convair, and for the city of Fort Worth. Back in 1946, there were skeptics, even in Fort Worth, who said that a plane as big as a B-36 could never get off the ground. As time went by and as B-36s went into operation with Air Force units, and as Convair developed still more powerful models of the B-36, these skeptics faded away. 
Today, the fleets of B-36s operated by the Strategic Air Command are recognized throughout the world, particularly in Russia, as tremendous fighting machines. Indeed, military strategists and international diplomats have said that the atomic and hydrogen bombs and the method of delivering them, meaning the SAC's fleets of B-36s, are doing more to prevent a third world war than any other single factor. To citizens of Fort Worth, however, the B-36 is a homegrown, home-flown product, built by Convair and flown by Carswell. As a city official, I'm extremely proud of the fact that every B-36 in the world was built right here in Fort Worth, at this plant on the shores of our own Lake Worth. In recent years, these B-36s have done more to publicize Fort Worth than any other single product. Fort Worth owes a debt of gratitude to Convair and its employees. It has helped to make this area the second largest aircraft manufacturing center in the nation. Since the plant was built in 1942, its payrolls have pumped approximately $700 million into the economic stream of Fort Worth. I understand the current payroll for approximately 18,000 employees of Convair's Fort Worth plant is about $7 million a month and likely to stay in this neighborhood. New industries have followed Convair to Fort Worth and have been organized here because of Convair. All of this has added to our growth. In 1940 B.C., B.C. standing for before Convair, the city's population was 177,000 people. By the next census, in 1950 A.C., after Convair, it had grown to 277,000 people. We're also proud of the fact that Convair has made itself a good neighbor, participating wholeheartedly in community affairs and civic life. Each year, Convair and its employees through their Contrib Club have vigorously supported the United Fund. And during the Korean, Korean crisis, they gave more blood to Red Cross than the remainder of Tarrant County put together. Besides assisting this community, these machinist union members, your faithful employees who built a B-36s, have contributed much to national defense, perhaps more significantly than many of us realize. They will continue to contribute as they maintain B-36s and other planes for the Air Force, keeping them in fighting trim for any eventuality. <clears throat> Again, as acting mayor of our city of good old Cowtown and B-36 town, I am happy for the honor of participating in this memorial occasion when the final B-36 is being officially delivered by, to the United States Air Force. Thank you, Mayor McKnight. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you the man who runs Convair, my boss. He himself is a four-star general and a former commander of the Air Material Command. He knows about the airplane business from both sides of the fence as an Air Force officer and as an aircraft company president. His distinguished military career began in 1917, so it's obvious that I cannot, in the time allotted, recount all of his accomplishments, which are numerous. I would like to mention, however, that it was General McNarney who succeeded the then General of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower, in 1945 as Commanding General of the United States Forces in the European Theater and Commander-in-Chief of the United States Forces of Occupation in Germany. General McNerney was a senior member of the United Nations Military Staff Committee and during 1949 served as Special Advisor to the Secretary of Defense. At the time of his retirement from active duty in January 1952, he was chief of the Department of Defense's Management Committee. Shortly thereafter, he became president of Convair. I introduce to you now General Joseph T. McNarney. <clears throat> Mr. Ashton General Griswold, 
Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the announced purpose of the ceremony here today is to observe the delivery of the last B-36 to the United States Air Force. The delivery will be made in a few moments. But I think it would be a mistake to give the occasion no broader perspective than this. For over 10 years, the employees of Convair Fort Worth have been designing and building a new kind of weapon, a global striking force. It is the first such weapon in the world has ever known. The first weapon with range enough to reach targets on the other side of the world from bases in the United States and return. The first weapon capable of unloosing immediate and crippling destruction on the enemy with the absolute minimum combat exposure of American lives. The first weapon capable of enforcing the peace by threat of instantaneous and overwhelming retaliation. Today, with the delivery of this plane, we are, in effect, putting the last rivet in place in this revolutionary new weapon. We have built, this, <coughs> built it to serve for many years to come. We have built it with a growth potential that is not yet fully realized. The plane you see here today has only 20% of common parts with the first B-36 off the line. Changes and improvements have increased the B-36's performance amazingly. Its horsepower has been doubled. Both speed and altitude have maturely increased. I am not permitted to say how much. And it is worth noting that even with these many changes, Convair reduced the man hours necessary to build a B-36 from 350,000 to 142,000, and was able to reduce the plane's anticipated unit cost to the government by some 15%, despite the continuously increasing wage and material costs. With all this, every B-36 was delivered on schedule for the last two and one-half years. As to the plane's future growth, Convair has a contract with the Air Force, which anticipates that each B-36 in service will be returned to Fort Worth for overhaul and modernization every two years throughout its operational life. SAMSAC, as the program is known, is the first contract to be awarded under the Air Force's plan of returning a product to the manufacturer for maintenance and repair, instead of doing the work itself in its own depots. The Air Force adopted this plan on the theory that it is more economical for the manufacturer to modernize and overhaul the airplane which he has produced. Since he has the necessary equipment on hand, the technical know-how, and personnel qualified and trained to do the work. The engineer, <coughs> the entire aircraft industry is watching the program, and several aircraft companies have sent teams to Convair to find out how we are running SAMSAC. Several thousand employees will be involved in the SAMSAC program for a number of years to come. The FICON project, which makes a carrier for fighter-type aircraft out of the B-36, and which gives the, B <coughs> the Air Force the ability to conduct long-range, high-speed reconnaissance missions, is another example of B-36 growth yet to come. The feasibility of the FICON concept has already been proven. Early this year, the Air Force disclosed that it had given to Convair an order to modify a number of B-36 reconnaissance bombers into FICON carriers. The first production model FICON airplane, that is the first B-36 airplane modified to the FICON configuration of the current contract, flew successfully just a few weeks ago. And so, while we have completed our B-36 production assignment, we are by no means through with the B-36. It will be a familiar sight in these parts for years to come. We of Convair look forward, however, to our next full production assignment, 
to the day when this vitally important strategic production line is again fully active. The lights of the assembly building will not be dark for long, for they cannot be if America is to maintain the kind of air power and being necessary to deter aggression. We must not and will not allow the enemy to capture the advantage of quantitative and qualitative superiority in the weapons of strategic decision, for to do so would be to invite disaster. Many of you know that Convair has for several years been developing a new long-range supersonic bomber. Naturally, we expect great things of it. I cannot tell you when this plane will go into production, but I can assure you that both Convair and the Air Force are working diligently toward this end. <coughs> and so, as we come to the end of one production program and stand on the threshold of another, I would say to the friends of Convair who are here today, thank you for joining us. To Convair employees, I say, be proud of the job you have done, the new force you have built, and the new strength you have given your nation with the B-36. And as this last rivet goes into place, I would say to the representatives of the Air Force who have honored us with their presence here, take this finished weapon with you to freedom's front line. May it always be as successful in its assigned combat mission of preventing war as it has been up to date. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, General McNerney. Our next speaker has likewise had a distinguished career in the Air Force. And like General McNerney, he too is a native of Pennsylvania. I'll not try to trace his military career, which began in 1929, and which carried our speaker to all parts of the world. Rather, I'll just hit a few high spots in his career. He was in the thick of World War II. In 1943, he was named Chief of Staff of the 8th Fighter Command in Europe, and the following year he became Commanding General. In October of 1944, he became Chief of Staff of the 2nd Bombardment Division in Europe. In May of 1945, he was appointed Chief of Staff of the 8th Air Force and later became Assistant Chief of Air Staff for Operations. In August of 1946, the month the first experimental B-36 took off for the first time here in Fort Worth, General Griswold went to Japan and shortly thereafter assumed command of the 20th Air Force. In September 1938, he was named Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Materiel at Air Force Headquarters in Washington. In December of 1950, he became Military Director of Production and Requirements on the Department of Defense Munitions Board. In April of 1952, General Griswold is appointed Commanding General of the Third Air Force in England. In May of 1954, he became Vice Commander of the Strategic Air Command with headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska. All of the B-36s in the world are operated by the Strategic Air Command. We, are, we at Convair are proud that the Vice Commander could come to Fort Worth for the official delivery of the last B-36 off of our assembly line. May I introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Major General Francis H. Griswold. General McNarney, Mr. S. and Wine, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be down here and look at your smiling faces. Being born in Pennsylvania, it's always a relief to come to Texas, you know. But I'm happy to be here to represent General LeMay in the Strategic Air Command. Now, General LeMay could not come because his father had a very serious operation yesterday morning. So he felt that it was just absolutely impossible to get here. So I'll do my best to say what I think he would have said were he here. 
Now, the occasion of the last B-36, coming off Convair's Great Fourth, uh, Fort Worth lines, warrants much more than just passing notice. It is in no sense an obituary. Rather, it is an opportunity to focus attention on the role the men and women of Convair and Fort Worth have played in the national defense picture. The B-36 bomber is, and has been for some years, one of the most potent factors in existence for the prevention of war. At the same time, should the forces of communism engage us in a fight to the finish, the free world will put full reliance in the immediate future on the B-36 and on the strategic air command crews who fly her. This combination, the B-36 and SAC, did not easily reach its present highly effective stature. As most of you know, the B-36 program suffered considerable growing pains since its inception in 1941. The immediate needs of World War II interrupted production of this great plane. Post-war inactivity further postponed production and delivery. But finally, when the hard-learned lessons of strategic bombardment and the decisive effect it had on Japan and Germany were fully recognized, the B-36 got the green light. Even then, there was no effort to freeze the design or produce aircraft that did not keep up with the times. Throughout recent years, Convair has successfully improved the capabilities of the B-36, cut production costs, increased range, altitude, load, and speed capacities, in addition to perfecting the armament. The history of the B-36 and the Air Forces are closely allied. In July 1947, the Air Force became an independent service under the Unification Act. On August 28th of the same year, the first production model, B-36, was flown. And exactly a year later, the first B-36 was delivered to the 7th Bombardment Wing of the 8th Air Force, which has been your neighbor across the runways for some considerable time. Since that date, when the Air Force consisted of about 300,000 people, to the present point where it is some 900,000 strong, Convair has supplied the Strategic Air Command with all of its long-range heavy bombardment and reconnaissance aircraft. The faith that was instilled by the B-36 has been much more than justified. To those who early realized the potential of the B-36, it has been great expectations fulfilled. Therefore, we can today commemorate with pride the delivery of this B-36 to members of the 92nd Bomb Wing of Fairchild Air Force Base, Washington, even though it be the last. This crew is one of the many throughout the Strategic Air Command who have gained familiarity with the B-36. On many occasions, it has been their home for 30 or more hours on a mission that has taken them thousands of miles through the stratosphere. They have come to know its marathon bomber intimately and thoroughly. By rigorous training, they have been able to utilize its capabilities to their fullest. Weather is no longer an obstacle. They can bomb almost as accurately with radar at 40,000 feet in the darkened skies with clouds obscuring the ground as William Tell shot the apple off his son's head. Their navigational ability is no less precise. In any kind of weather, they can take off, locate their targets, and return to their designated base. Hand in glove with successful bombing goes reconnaissance. In this category, the RB-36 has also proven outstanding. Strategic long-range reconnaissance is the invaluable forerunner of the bombardment mission. Target intelligence must be accumulated. Photographic, weather, and electronic information is needed. In addition to extensive mapping and post-strike intelligence, the crews who fly the RB-36s solely for these purposes render a vital service. Again, the RB-36 meets all their requirements fully and provides the most effective means for global operations. Twice each year, every wing in the Strategic Air Command carries out a mission exactly similar to the one it would be charged with in actual combat. Should war come, SAC crews are ready. And thanks to Convair 
and the many other companies who supply the Air Force with weapons and equipment, America would not be forced to postpone retaliation. It would be immediate. The B-36 permits that statement to be made without reservations. It has been for some years now the mainstay of that long-range capability. The other day, the most proficient reconnaissance crews in SAC, two from each wing, met at Fairchild Air Force Base, Washington, for the annual reconnaissance and navigation competition. This contest is going on right now as we are gathered here to pay respects to the B-36. Some of her forerunners on this very same production line are at this time boring through the skies on a mission that might bring her the coveted victory in this contest. Again, there is very little difference between this and an actual combat mission. In a few weeks, the SAC bombing and navigation competition will take place. Aptly called the World Series of Bombing, this annual contest summons the optimum proficiency from the best crews in SAC. Now what does all this add up to? It means that both the planes and men must be at peak performance conditions at all times. All the training throughout the year is aimed at readiness, and these annual competitions prove just how good they really are. And believe me, you can be proud of their record. So long as radicalism threatens the reason and the democratic way of life is exposed to attack, instruments such as the B-36 will be a vital necessity to the security of the United States. SAC crews have flown B-36s practically everywhere, in both hemispheres from the Orient to Greenland and over the poles. Long-range heavy bombardment elements of this command have been overseas in Japan, North Africa, and the United Kingdom. They have added to man's knowledge of the elements by studies of the jet stream on a non-stop 8,700-mile flight from Japan to Maine. They have carried 10,000-pound bomb loads further than any other aircraft in operation. You know the accomplishments of the B-36, and you can be proud of them because they stem from your hands. The era of the B-36 is by no means a closed book even though today marks the last B-36 to be delivered. Under the maintenance and overhauling program, your work will continue to keep the B-36 in combat readiness. This last B-36 will join others and become an integral part of the nation's insurance that we are in business to keep the peace, but prepared to bring defeat to those who might be so stupid as to break it. Now, just a little ad lib here that each and every one of you identified with this B-36 can rest assured that because you built the B-36, we have not been engaged in a war, and there's a good chance that we won't be. Thank you. Thank you, General Griswold. Now, the crew from the 92nd Bomb Wing will board the B-36. Now, ladies and gentlemen, while the engines are being started, we ask you to keep well back and once the airplane has taxied out towards the end of the runway, these near ropes will be removed and taken down, and you can walk out towards the edge of the concrete to have a closer look at the actual takeoff of this airplane. At exactly 3.48 p.m., there will be a flyby of six B-36s from Carswell. These planes will be flying from north to south down the runway at approximately 1,000 feet altitude. We very much appreciate having the cars will ban uh, for these ceremonies and there will be more music after the 36 takes off. Uh, again, following the takeoff of the B-36, we will reopen the C-99 for visitors who wish to tour it. As you probably know, it is a transport version of the B-36 and the world's largest land plane. So as soon as the 36 
starts up and taxis out, you will be able to get further out on the field. This time, I would very much like to thank you all for having taken the time and trouble to be here. Yeah,